thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, this is the ninth in a series of lectures funded by the estate of Bradford Abelson, a USA alum who worked in who worked tirelessly for interreligious dialogue and mutual understanding between religions as a U.S. Navy chaplain. You're going to hear more about him this evening. It is my hope that tonight's discussion on peace, restorative justice, and the healing of memories usefully expands the mission of Brad's gift. The original intent of these lectures was to increase understanding between worldviews and to courageously work towards peace. In this way, I can think of few people more fitting than tonight's guest, Father Michael Lapsley, an Anglican priest who fought against apartheid, was part of the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa, and has since worked to educate groups and individuals about restorative justice and breaking the cycle of suffering and pain. Father Lapsley has courageously stood up against oppression and violence, uh, 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 oppression and violence against himself. Equally though, he has bravely lived out the messages of honesty, listening, restoration, and love. He is a living testimony to the power and possibility of peace, and I'm honored that he is our guest. In tonight's lecture, Father Lapsley will talk about healing the wounds of history. After his talk, we will have time for questions and answers, where I will distribute this mic. With that, please welcome this evening's speaker, Father Michael Lapsley. Uh, good evening, everyone. Healing the wounds of history. May I begin by acknowledging the First Nations who lived and walked on this sacred land. Thank you, Professor Zach, for the kind words of welcome. I'm honored to give the Abelson Religious Reconciliation Lecture tonight. I'm also in awe of all that Father Brad Abelson achieved in his 50 years on earth. My great regret is that we are not having a dialogue here together with Captain Abelson. There are so many things that I would like to learn from him. Nevertheless, I will frame what I have to say as a conversation or perhaps a letter between the two of us on two sides of the grave, focusing on healing and reconciliation, moral and spiritual injury. I am inviting you, the audience, to be an interlocutor. Dear Captain, dear Father, dear Brad, I have a feeling that you are smiling at us today. When I was last here, at least virtually, it was the 100th anniversary of the infamous Tulsa Race Massacre. I wonder what has happened since the anniversary took place. There were promises made, including by the President of the United States. Are they being fulfilled? In particular, I'm wondering how the families are feeling about what took place around the time of the anniversary. For a moment, the United States focused on the horror of what happened at Tulsa a hundred years ago. We recall the words of 107-year-old Viola Fletcher calling for justice, for acknowledgement, and for reparations. Thanks to the international media, millions of people across the globe witnessed the testimony of Viola Fletcher to the House Judiciary Subcommittee in Washington. Dear Brad, what would you have advocated for in response to
to the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Specifically, what would you have said about reparations? Your identity as an Anglican priest and as a chaplain to the military has some parallels to my own. I too am an Anglican priest, or as they say in the United States of America, an Episcopalian. For 16 years, I was a member and a chaplain of a liberation movement with a military wing. As an adolescent, I was a committed pacifist. I had read my Jesus of Nazareth, my Martin Luther King, my Mahatma Gandhi. I was convinced that we could achieve justice by nonviolent means in any and every situation. For me, it was a principle and a tactic. Then came the events of Soweto in South Africa in 1976. Unarmed schoolchildren began to be shot in the streets until within a year, more than a thousand had been killed. In the face of that reality, my pacifism fell apart. I joined the African National Congress of South Africa, which had begun an armed struggle in 1960 after nearly 50 years of nonviolent struggle. I remember an interview with Oliver Tambo, who was the president of the ANC. He was asked about the armed struggle and his voice reduced to a whisper and he said, they forced us into it. They forced us into it. No romanticization of arms. And I'm sure a recognition that there would be a terrible spiritual and moral cost to that decision. From its formation in 1912, the demand of the liberation movement was always for negotiations, to sit at the table. Finally, in 1990, when the apartheid regime said, we will negotiate, the armed struggle was suspended. Some writers have argued that during the 1980s alone, we had lost more than a million lives throughout the countries of Southern Africa as a consequence of the actions of the apartheid regime. Just three months after the release of Nelson Mandela from 27 years in prison and on the eve of negotiations, I received a letter bomb in the post hidden inside the pages of two religious magazines. As you can see in that blast, I lost both my hands and an eye and my eardrums were shattered. Sometimes journalists ask me, Father, did the bomb affect you? Surprise, surprise. Of course it did. Anything which is life-threatening will be life-changing and will either cause us to diminish or to grow. So I survived an assassination attempt. Perhaps the greatest irony of the attack on my life is that the only automatic weapon I'm, I've ever used in my life is my tongue. So I did not need my hands for shooting, but they left my weapon working reasonably well, don't you think? <laughs> in my view, apartheid in its core was a theology of death carried out in the name of the gospel of life. My key role in the liberation struggle was to mobilize people of faith to oppose apartheid and to support the struggle for freedom. The struggle against apartheid was not simply a human rights issue 
or a justice issue or a political issue. It was a faith issue because the apartheid state claimed divine guidance for what it was doing. Either apartheid was true, that the most important thing about us is the color of our skin, or the gospel is true, that we all have equal value as children of God. A perverted form of Christianity was the principal ideological weapon used by the apartheid state. I had excellent medical treatment, but what saved my soul was the prayers and love of people of faith and hope of different religions and traditions from all over the world. I was the recipient of interfaith solidarity from Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, as well as from atheists and communists. My own story was acknowledged, reverenced, recognized, and given a moral content. People said that what happened to me was wrong. When I returned to South Africa, after 16 years away, I discovered a damaged nation. A nation damaged in our humanity. Damaged by what we had done, by what had been done to us, and by what we failed to do. And all of us with a story to tell. For many South Africans, their stories had not been acknowledged, reverenced, and recognized in the way that mine was. I had been a freedom fighter. I began to discover a new vocation to become a healer in the sense of accompanying others in their journey of healing. No one had said that what happened to them was wrong. We developed a process that we called the healing of the memories. It was conceived of as a parallel process to South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was a South African process. In 1998, we created an, an institute for healing of memories. In the first year of our existence, we were invited Firstly, to Rwanda, four years after the genocide, and secondly, to New York, to New York City. Many of the participants in the New York workshop had been part of the civil rights movement. They said it was the first time they had an opportunity to speak about their pain. Although a very small organization, now the Institute for Healing of Memories North America has extended its reach from New York to Honolulu. Earlier today, we completed a Healing of Memories workshop here on this university campus. Thank you to Tonya Anderson, Dr. Tonya Anderson. Where's Dr. Tonya Anderson? I think, you know, I don't have hands, so I can't clap. Do you think we could clap for her? And then a second clap for everyone who came to the workshop. And the last and final clap for the facilitators. Thank you for being a wonderful audience that claps on invitation. <laughs> for quite a few years, we have been working with military veterans, especially in Arizona, uh, Minnesota, and also in Hawaii. Dear Brad, I would have dearly liked to discuss with you what we have learned from those with whom we have ministered. I cannot help wondering how you were shaped and wounded by your 20 years of service in the military. It seems to me that there is an inherent contradiction between being a priest of the church or indeed any universal faith and being part of the armed forces 
of a nation state. Did you see it as a contradiction? It is noteworthy that for the first 300 years of Christianity, it was not permissible for Christians to participate in armies. Subsequently, and may I say tragically, that pacifist tradition became the minority tradition, position of churches. Today it is championed by Quakers, Mennonites, and communities like the Bruderhof. I think it must be confusing for God to listen to people on both sides of an armed conflict praying for victory. Maybe God finds it more entertaining when it's two opposing football, basketball, or baseball teams praying for victory. I'm curious, dear Brad, about what made you expand and one may say liberate military chaplaincy beyond homiletics and pastoral care to become a champion of religious reconciliation. Dear Brad, it was in the same year that you went to join the ancestors that the first ever World Conference of Chief of Military Chaplains took place in Cape Town, South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu and I were both speakers at that conference. Archbishop Tutu cut to the chase immediately. He began by speaking about how military chaplains minister to soldiers who are preparing to kill or to be killed. Throughout history, we have always romanticized and mystified war. In that moment, Desmond Tutu cut through the verbiage to speak ever so plainly, ministering to people who were preparing to either kill or be killed. In your years as a military chaplain, dear Brad, I am sure you interacted with many military personnel who were diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD speaks to the psychological, emotional, and spiritual effects of trauma on the human person. I have no doubt that some of you here tonight have or are suffering from PTSD or you know people who are. Under the big umbrella of PTSD, I'm sure that in many cases what we should be talking about is actually moral and spiritual injury. Part of our humanness is the development of conscience, the sense of what is right and what is wrong. Our conscience is the inner voice which tells us what is right and what is wrong. All the great religious traditions have a moral code that forbids the taking of life. Throughout history, we have put uniforms on people and given them permission to kill other human beings and said that is not murder. We reward them with medals. When they return from war, we have military parades and the band sings. Well, at least if it was a popular war. But since time immemorial, old soldiers have cried themselves to sleep. Many of the great faith traditions of the world believe that there is something of the divine in all of us. So that is why when we attack another human being, we are attacking the divine in them as well as the divine in ourselves. After the war ended in Vietnam, many United States military veterans 
found their way back to Vietnam to try and deal with not PTSD, but their moral and spiritual injuries. I guess it would not be very good for recruiting if we told young people, please join the military. Your enemy is actually in essence the same as you. The same fear, hopes and dreams for the future. And after you have killed people, you will not be the same again. You will be forever haunted by what you did. There is a cliche that trauma is either transformed or transmitted. Soldiers are often both perpetrators and victims at the same time. Soldiers are trained to take the lives of other human beings. That they are wounded morally and spiritually is a sign of our common humanity. Personally, I am glad that participating in war makes people sick. The ones we should worry about are people who kill other human beings and are not affected. My own father was a soldier in the Second World War. My mother once commented that the man who went to war was not the man who returned. During armed conflict, we give permission for combatants to kill people, and when the war is over, we withdraw that permission. Society is happy to see military veterans as heroes or as villains. In neither case do we want to know about the nightmares and demons which veterans endure, sometimes for the rest of their lives. While society is happy with the mantra, thank you for your service, we do not want to hear the stories either of what soldiers have seen and done, nor of their inner turmoil and torment. Domestic, family or sexual abuse is commonplace among veterans. Together with alcohol and drug abuse. But in most cases, it's kept under wraps. Even more alarming is the reality that more soldiers in the United States of America die at their own hands than in combat. I wonder, Captain Abelson, if you and I would have been able to have a conversation about the United States' addiction to war, and dare I say it, to guns. Do you agree, Captain Abelson, that the Second Amendment has become an idol? You were a visionary for religious reconciliation and traveled the world in that pursuit. Whilst you remained part of the military, I can't help wondering whether your experience had led you to a deeper commitment to being a peacemaker and a reconciler. I am sure that your travels made you acutely aware that a disproportionate number of armed conflicts in the world today have a religious dimension. Why else would a naval chaplain be so committed to religious reconciliation across the world? Many years ago, I read a beautiful book entitled Healing Life's Hurts, Healing Memories Through the Five Stages of Forgiveness by Dennis and Matthew Lynn. It is a Christocentric work written by Christians for Christians. It focuses on me and Jesus and me and the family. In South Africa, 
the majority of people call themselves Christians. But we also have a very substantial Muslim population as well as Jewish, Hindu and Buddhists, not to mention the growing number of atheists and agnostics. Also, our deepest wounds were related to how the political system had affected the individual. So I took a number of the insights of the lens, but liberated the concept of healing of memories. We focus on how the nation's journey has affected us as individuals. We, fought, we, we, we sought to find a place for people of all faiths and no faith. Yet, in the context of war and oppression that had lasted for centuries, we encourage people to see how their own wounds are often intergenerational in nature. As an institute, we accept that not all people are religious, but we do believe that all people are spiritual beings. I am sure, Captain Abelson, we are on the same page when it comes to our inalienable right to dignity. However, I cannot help wondering what Captain Abelson felt about President Eisenhower's farewell address when he said, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist." Unquote. Is it not true that the military-industrial complex needs unending war to sustain its economic viability. Who will benefit financially from Finland and Sweden joining NATO as all their weapon systems need to be aligned? They say it is an ill wind that blows no good. When COVID swept the world, all our weapons of mass destruction were of no use. The greatest heroes of the COVID pandemic was the Henry Reeves Brigade from Cuba. Rich and poor nations from East and West called on the Cubans to help them save lives. But was COVID not trying to tell us something about what is really important to us as human beings. On the one hand, there was vaccine nationalism with rich countries stockpiling. On the other, there were acts of solidarity. I am stating the obvious when I say that the wounds of COVID run deep into the soul of the nation with the deepest suffering being for indigenous communities and people of color. Nor must we forget the cost paid by courageous health, health workers across the world, often without remuneration or support. Part of our work in the Institute for Healing of Memories North America has been to create safe place, safe spaces where healthcare workers can be vulnerable and weak. The strongest also need places where it's okay to be weak. For generations to come, people will speak about who and what they lost during COVID, just like the Spanish flu of I have here 2018. I'm in 1918. I'm only 100 years out. In my naivety, I thought 
that in every country of the world, after COVID, the voters would be demanding that more and more money be spent on health care and less and less on war. I guess I had forgotten the biblical dictum that the children of darkness are often shrewder in their time than the children of light. Or perhaps even more appropriate, that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. There is another disease which we South Africans share with you as citizens of the United States. We South Africans believe in our own exceptionalism on the continent of Africa, just as the United States does in the world. Imagine for a moment if all countries, East and West, North and South, had departments of peace with higher budgets for peacemaking, conflict resolution and diplomacy than for arms and for the make, uh, uh, than, than for arms and the making of war. As a peacemaker yourself, Captain Abelson, I am wondering how you would see the present threat of nuclear war. What a terrible irony that the permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations who carry the greatest responsibility for world peace are, together with Germany, the greatest arms manufacturers. I am sure God weeps. I earnestly pray for a new worldwide peace movement. As you knew, Captain Abelson, all the great faith traditions of the world have the pursuit of peace as a core value. We must be vigilant against bad theology. Whenever religion is used to exclude or oppress people, it is an abuse of the core teachings of that religion. Across the world, including here in the United States, there is an inexorable process of abolishing the death penalty. Thank you to different organizations here in Oklahoma, as different as murder victims' families against the death penalty, the ACLU and the Episcopal Church, for advocating for Oklahoma to join the right side of history. Tragically at present, Oklahoma has the highest rate of executions in the United States of America. One day, one day, every state in the Union will abolish the death penalty. That day will come as surely as day follows night. There's plenty to be despondent about in the world today. So what are the signs of hope? I am convinced that young people will save us, not for the first time in our history, including in many conservative evangelical churches, it has been young people who have challenged their parents homophobia, and commitment to heteronormativity because of their own lived experience. When it comes to the oldest wound of the human family, the abuse and oppression of women by men, faith communities have often lagged behind the rest of society. In the face of the massacring of school children, it has been children themselves taking on the gun lobby and challenging their parents as they marched for their lives. After the murder of George Floyd and the flowering of Black Lives Matter in the middle of the pandemic, thousands upon thousands of especially black, but also many white people 
marched against racism. New alliances were made with indigenous people. Many of us white people often for the first time began to struggle with the reality of white privilege, which we continue to enjoy. The need for reparations will not disappear until it is addressed. Every day, with ever greater frequency and urgency, we see the reality that Mother Earth is profoundly wounded. I have a feeling that the Greta Thunbergs of the world are rising in their millions and are not going to stop until the political class and indeed all of us act differently to save the planet. During the apartheid years, there was a government gazette once a week with a long list of publications that were banned. These included every single word ever spoken by Nelson Mandela. The object of the exercise was to prevent white people having to deal with shame and guilt and responsibility. Sound familiar? It is time to heal the wounds of history so that we can become participants in God's dream for all of us. Captain Abelson, thank you for being God's co-worker in God's project for reconciliation with the whole created order. We will honor your memory by seeking to play our part. I thank you. If you have questions, I can bring you a microphone. If you have a question, raise your hand. Well, <laughs> you may be able to project. I might be able to project. I'd like to know more about the process involved in the healing of memories. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. I must say, I, 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 I wasn't sure if I was going to get clapped or stoned after what I said. So I was pleasantly surprised that I got clapped. And I must say I was even more impressed. Is it, where's, it, where's the person who gave me the blanket? Robin, Robin, Robin. You know, I was expecting when I came here that, as I say, I'd said to people in South Africa, I've prepared this speech, maybe I'll get stoned. But the first person I met was Robin, who gave me a blanket instead of throwing stones. So how good is that? So the process of healing of memories. Um, uh, our core workshop is, is a, uh, which we've just had here, is a two and a half day process. Um, we had we had a small group. We could have up to twenty five people at a time. A process that takes uh, two and a half days. Um, we on the f we have a session on the first day where we create community together, um, and we set a, a key ground rule of excuse me of confidentiality, and that helped people feel safe in in, in the process. Um, we we uh, also um, have what we call an emotional trigger. And, and here we've been using a set of pictures. Some places we've used uh, a short drama. And by an emotional trigger, we're trying to get people to be in touch quickly with feelings and memories. And we focus on feelings because that's where the poison lies, not what we think about the past, what we feel about the past. And then we give people a set of questions to reflect on overnight. Uh, how has the past of the nation affected you as an individual? How has the experience of your parents and grandparents affected you? What has been the, the, your best and what, your horriblest and your most beautiful experience? Also, how, how has been your experience in, in, your, in a faith community? Because often in faith communities, it's been life-giving, but people have also been very hurt. 
Um, so the good news and the bad news of our lives, summarized by three questions. What did I do? What was done to me? What did I fail to do? The second day, we get people to draw their life story. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a competition to find out who's a Rembrandt or, but, you know, a way of getting your story out and, and, and being able to, uh, what I like to say, create a mirror. And then the whole of the second day, we tell each other our stories in groups of five, six, seven people. And in the process, people begin to be healers of one another uh, because it's a process not of discussion, but of talking and of listening, not so much with the ears, but with the heart. Um, and then we have a session where we, we begin to be able to understand how all feelings are normal, but there are feelings that if they're, if they're destructive feelings, uh, like hatred and bitterness, even though we may have good reasons for them, if we keep them inside us, they destroy us. And there are other feelings. So there are feelings we need to let go of for our own sake and other feelings we want to take with, like kindness and generosity and support and beautiful feelings. Uh, then on day three, which we did here in this place, today we give people clay and we invite them to create a symbol of peace. And then we end with the creation of a ceremony. Now, if the group of people were all Christians, they'd have quotes from the Bible, they'd sing religious songs. If it was an interfaith, they'd have something from the, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, great religious texts, or... In a, in a, like in a university, um, I was going to say in a university like a prison, I'm not suggesting a university like a prison, <laughs> but, but where, where people uh, are not coming wearing a religious hat, we'd create, we still create a ceremony with song and poetry, um, as, which is what we did together. And then we um, present the peace symbols and, and then we invite people to light a candle for somebody. And sometimes it'll be, without explaining it, it'll be, a key person in the story, maybe someone I deeply love or someone who's hurt me that I want to forgive. So that's the core, core business that we do. There are other processes that continue after that, but that's the, the heart of the matter. And we say to people, we promise you one step on the road to healing. But if, for example, something happened to you 40 years ago and it's the first time you've shared it, it can be life-changing. It could be the point that you begin to let victimhood go and begin to live, live a life. Uh, because also, maybe this is the last thing to say, is that um, uh, if horrible things happen to us, it's likely to be one of two journeys. One is uh, victims who become victimizers, who become victims that crosses generations, uh, or victim survivor, victor, in the sense of taking back agency once more. So that's the brief. That's the, that's the short answer to your long question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, I can keep asking you questions. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Do you, really do, you want to, do you want to take the blanket back? No. <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. Um, I'm not really sure how to phrase this as a question or, you know, really how to articulate what I'm thinking. But I mean, in this country, something that I've noticed that I find really disturbing is that, like I grew up a Christian you know my father was a preacher um, Baptist and um, you know I was always taught you know my favorite hymn was you know we you know we are Christians by our love wow. and, I know the chorus is yeah and it was something that I have been struggling with you know in the last several years is watching the growing of this sort of Christian nationalism that started out really fringe and now has been picked up by, you know, really well-known politicians. And, you know, what I want to know is how do you even, you know, having been harmed by people in the church, reconcile with wanting to see humans as, you know, wanting to have compassion for them, right, right. but uh -huh. also being rather disgusted and terrified of where things are going and how to be part of stopping that. You know, thank you. Um, we could have a whole seminar about <laughs> what you have just uh, asked. But, but so the second part of it is, uh, I suppose for me, um, 
Oh. Well, it's very interesting. Jesus says, love your enemies. But maybe sometimes you've got to accept that they are your enemies. Uh, and, 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 but you're still called to love them. What does loving them mean? It means that you see that, that we're all children of God. Uh, and also, somebody who we deeply disagree with, like us, has been shaped by their life experience as well. Uh, so, so one of the things that our work teaches us is that we are a wounded humanity. And I think recognizing my own woundedness can help me have compassion towards the woundedness of another. Um, and I mean, you know, these words are easy to come out of my lips, but I know it's, I can see by the look on your face, that this is tough stuff. And it's not least tough stuff in a time in the history of the United States when it's been, perhaps never been as divided. Perhaps the last time it was as divided as it is now is the Civil War. Uh, in terms of people being uh, you know, far, far apart. Um, but w Christian nationalism, wh wh wherever you know, nationalism gets into bed with a specific religion, um, often you have religion, and I said that in my speech, uh, that wherever religion is used to justify forms of oppression, it is an abuse of the core teaching of that religion. Religion is being instrumentalized and it's nothing to do with what that core teaching is, because the chorus you quoted is more the heart of what Jesus taught us uh, than many of the things that are that are happening. But also, it's interesting. I, 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 I really do want to have this conversation with Captain Abelson. It's a pity he's on the other side of the grave, because he saw something as he traveled the world um, when he advocated for reconciliation between the great religions of the world. Um, and, 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 and we are inclined to demonize the other. You know, post September the 11th, we demonized all Muslims. You know, uh, maybe there is a tiny group of Muslims who are very extreme, just as there's a very tiny group of Christians who are very extreme, and Hindu and Buddhist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then we demonize a whole religion. So I think he was he was he was onto something very important, and that is that. Um, none of us have a monopoly on wisdom. You know? um, yes, I'm a committed Christian, I'm seeking to follow Jesus, but that doesn't mean there's not wisdom in Islam, wisdom in Buddhism, wisdom in Hinduism, and that we have to learn from, from the religions. Um, I think if you're a person of faith, we need to pray for the people that we feel in opposition to. And I think in the end, of course, that may not change them, but it will change you. Because in a sense, the discovery is the only person I can change is myself. But we need a 10-day dialogue. But thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question. Yeah. Any okay. other questions? Yeah. I was going to ask, do you ever find it isolating your quest for peace among those in your community? Because my own family is Jewish and I've advocated for peace among like Palestinian and Israelis. And my own family has called me a fake Jew for that. They told you? My own family has called me like a fake Jewish person because I want peace between Palestinians and Israelis. Do you ever find that quest for peace isolating among your own community? Yes. The short answer is yes. <laughs> the, 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 um, uh, I think part of the great moral blindness of the world is that what the Israeli state is doing to the Palestinians. Uh, it's a great moral blindness. And, and what is beautiful is a number of people like you who are Jewish uh, and clearly you're not a self-hating Jew. You know, you're happy to say, I'm Jewish, uh, but you see the oppression and the injustice of what is being done to the, to the Palestinians. But I think, um, you know, if you want to be loved by everybody, stand for nothing. If you stand for, on principle, if you stand for what is just, not everybody will love you for it. But however, you'll find companions across the whole human family. You'll find other Jewish people. I mean, there are, there, 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 uh, there are young Israeli boys 
in jail in Israel because they don't want to fight Palestinians. No? Those are your brothers and sisters, but you'll find brothers and sisters among Christians and Muslims and Hindus as well. So you've got, you've got a cost of isolation from your family, but you'll find a new family. That's very beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. I guess to add another facet to this question, um, I was brought up like super Christian. My parents are pastors. My grandmother is. And hearing you preach about like acceptance and not spreading oppression and like, what's the word? Like ostracizations of people. Do you find that like, like he said, like isolating amongst like the, I guess, I don't want to say more popular sect of Christians that like preach oppression indirectly um do you find that like isolating as well or like how do you deal with like people who like come against you in that aspect well i suppose what's important um as well um is not see i think the danger is that we become self-righteous you know we've got it all you're in darkness <laughs> and and um i i uh, i with my brother uh, Pilani, we just went to uh, New Mexico. The reason we went to New Mexico was to see one of the world's great spiritual writers, a man called Father Richard Raw. We didn't see him because he was, you know, not well. But he started something called the Center for Action and Contemplation. And what he recognized was that. We should work for justice and do our own internal work. And sometimes we can become people who pursue justice and we become burnt out and we become cynical and we become bitter. So he recognized that, that as much as we work out there for justice, all of us need to be dealing with our demons, our messed upness, our contradictions forever forever um, but also um, we, we at the end of our workshop we had a ceremony and uh, um, one of the things that happened in the workshop is each group does a presentation and one group did a beautiful presentation on self-love you know? and they made the point that I think it might have been Tony who made the point that uh, self-love is not narcissism you know? there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a healthy and it's very interesting in the Christian tradition, Jesus says, you should love your neighbor as yourself. No? And sometimes people end up doing lots of things for other people, but still despising themselves. And I think part of the deepest, deepest truth about ourselves is that we're beautiful. We're beautiful. You know? and, and we need to, uh, and sometimes when we've been wounded, we lose sight of that and we've got to you know, recover that. So I'm saying other things, but, but yes, yes, there will be uh, the pain of isolation. I mean, I was a white boy fighting in a war when the majority of the people fighting were black. So for some white people, and perhaps that's one of the reasons they tried to kill me, uh, because I had dared to cross that line. And they said that I was a... Um, uh, a traitor to the white race. You no, know, no, 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 no. I'm loyal to the human race. I'm loyal to our common humanity. Because, you know, there, there, there's some things that you and I can't change. You can't change that you're black and beautiful. I can't change that I'm white and beautiful. But I, but I, but I can be, can't be part of creating a society in which we can all have dignity, in which we can all be people. Uh, one of my uh, favorite prayers is, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. So we, we knock our heads against concrete about the things we can't change, whether it's our gender, our sexual identity, our race, whatever. We can't change any of that, but we can work to create a more human society and a more human world. So yeah, thank you very much. Good.
You want a second, a second bite of the cherry? I do. I'd like to ask you, I've heard you talk about forgiveness, and I was reflecting on, I think her name is Robin, what she was saying earlier um, about the nationalism. There was also seems to be a pressure to, uh, probably because of the shame evoked, but to forgive and telling people, you know, I know I have a friend who, when I'm angry or hurt, she'll say, well, you have to pray for forgiveness, that you can forgive them. And it really irritates me. <laughs> so what's your question? <laughs> what is your approach to forgiveness? Okay, so we've agreed we're going to stay here for three days and three nights, okay? <laughs> Yeah. Now it's 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 interesting that, you know, we we don't call our workshop a forgiveness workshop. We call it healing of memories. Now, on the issue of forgiveness, I always want to talk out both sides of my mouth. You know? and by that I mean I want to say almost opposites in a sense. Um, you know, particularly in the in in the Christian community, forgiveness is one of our favorite words. Not surprisingly. Because, you know, we, we, we learned it on, our, if we're Christians, we learned it on our mother's knee. You know, um, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We hear, we hear it in the words of Jesus on the cross, where Jesus doesn't say, I forgive you. He says, Father, forgive them. He offers a prayer for forgiveness. But because it's, it, it, it's so commonplace in our faith tradition, the impression is created that forgiveness is something simple, and cheap and easy. Where for most human beings, it's costly, it's painful, and it's difficult. But also, and if I can put it in a very harsh way, um, sometimes we Christians use forgiveness as a weapon against hurting people. Oh, it sounds a terrible thing to say, but it's true. In a sense, you said, because you're a nice, gentle kind person you say it irritates me not i know i know i won't use bad language but <laughs> <laughs> but but because i but i'm going to hear that 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 in a sense um when we're hurting we don't need a sermon about forgiveness we need a hug we need we need we need people to hear our pain you know to hear that we're hurting perhaps then some further down the track we may choose to travel a journey of forgiveness. So that's one side of my mouth. My other side of my mouth is to say that I meet people across the world for whom, some of whom, where forgiveness is the obstacle to their healing. It's very interesting that the word in the New Testament for forgiveness, Afi Amy, is the same word as untying a knot. So where there is unforgiveness, we are each other's prisoner. So in a way, forgiveness is not about the other person. It's about ourselves, about what we need to do for our own liberation. There's um, uh, a woman I met, I'm trying to think of her name now, who's um, gone out of my head, but but her her daughter was murdered. And uh, she decided that she had forgiven the person who murdered her, her daughter. She decided. Then she saw one day there was an article in the paper saying the guy's going to be executed. She read in the paper, I want to be there. Well, well it turned out to be a false report. So then she asked to meet him. The family again, the family was divided. Some people, no, 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 no. But she decided that she wanted to to meet him. And she met him, and they began to travel a journey together. The guy who had murdered her daughter. And 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 so for her, her journey to forgiveness was a journey of 13 years. Not a journey of five minutes, a journey of 13 years. And when I met her, um, the guy who took her daughter's life uh, was still on death row. And, and, and so I said to her, well, 
how you feel if he's executed. Um, and she said, I will have lost a dear friend. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's why in my speech, you notice I made a reference in Oklahoma. I talked about the ACLU, the Episcopal Church, and I'm sure the Catholic Church as well, organizations who are against the death penalty, but they include murder victims' families against the death penalty. In other words, her saying, it won't, it won't bring our child back. It won't, it, won't, um, it won't stop our pain if another mother cries. No? So, so it's a, another whole, whole journey. Um, so, so I hope that helps a little bit uh, in this issue. But I think as a person of faith, I would say that um, you know, in our faith community, we talk about grace, grace being the power of God. I think sometimes we need God's help to even want to forgive, because often we damn well don't, <laughs> you know. So to even to want to, uh, as well. But I hope that. But but again, I'm also saying, sometimes the issue is not forgiveness. The issue is acknowledgement. Here uh, uh, and and people need to be supported and encouraged, and to make their own choices around that. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you for question two. <laughs> okay. So I think we're. We're now free to go home. Is that? Where's my brother? Where's the? Where's the? Where's the chief of the of the house? If we have one more question, maybe one more question. But other than that, not a question, but a thank you. Oh. Thank you for a sleepless night that I'll probably have tonight. Yeah. No, thank you, my sister, for that. I, th th there's, um, I, I, I once read that the um, uh, Spirit of God comes to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And, and, and I want to suggest that there is that part of all of us that needs to be comforted and a part of all of us that needs to be disturbed. So I would hope that I have both comforted you and disturbed you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.